Today's youth need teachers, volunteers, and most of all, well, they need you. I'm Doug Edwards, and I'm going to be talking with real youth mentors and students to give you the knowledge you need to be the best youth worker possible. This is Youth Worker on Fire. Hey, Youth Worker Nation, Doug Edwards here with Youth Worker on Fire, and we're here with Josh Douglas today. Josh is a youth pastor. I knew him when he was in school with my boys, with Ryan, actually, and he is a son of a pastor, and there are five of you boys. Is that right? Four brothers in all. I'm one of them, yeah, so you're three one of the brothers. Right. Yeah. Okay, there are four. All right, That's four. Right. See, I just I lose track. There's so many. So, <laughs> but, but you can tell us by our... Our walk, yeah. They know the Douglases, the Douglas walk, and uh, we all have a resemblance. Even though people tell you, my oldest brother, he's the the supermodel out of the group, oh. and we just got shorter and a little bit more of a teacup size as we went down. So, <laughs> okay. uh, but that's the, that's the story of the Douglases. You you can spot us in town. Don't worry. They are there. <laughs> so, pastor's son, yes, big deal. And then you became a youth pastor in this area, First Baptist Mount Dora. That's right. And in fact, you know, ministry having a father in the ministry mm -hmm. you know you see the good you see the bad yeah you see the yeah. ugly yeah as they say and in all that one would think well is this person going to run away from the faith are they going to um, give their heart to other things gravitate towards different things and all of our hearts tend to gravitate towards other things of course yeah. but yeah. i had a i had a dad that exuded instead of callousness you know towards the church or coldness towards people uh, definitely a dad who showed uh, compassion mm -hmm. and um, even in the midst of that compassion showed um, to be a champion for Christ. Mm. And I think that was essential just having a dad that, you know, he would try as a, you know, as a, as a weak, failed human being. And many times, just as we are um, sometimes weak, brittle human beings that mess up, don't get things right. But we strive to put our faith in the one who is strong, who is mighty, and who is wise. And so dad always pointed me towards striving after Christ. You know, that was the key, not stagnancy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not just staying in one place, but saying, how, how can I strive after something great? And really after someone, someone who is great. Well, well, Josh, and from there, let us into a little bit of your personal life. Catch us up to date. My name is Joshua Douglas. I grew up in Eustis, Florida. I call this home. Uh, my dad would tell you we're all Tennessee boys, though. Even yeah. though I uh, born in Wilmington, North Carolina, but raised in Tennessee for a good part. And so I became a Tennessee volunteer. Oh, really? And then we came down here to Florida, and uh, it was in Wachula, Florida. And you say that fast enough, it sounds like somebody say Kasuntite. That's right. You know, to you. <laughs> but that's in Hardy County, and he was a pastor down there. From there, you know, that was cattle ranching and orange groves and that type is a whole different life than this area. Well, I've been to Wachula That's several right. times. Yeah. And you have to want to go there. You don't go yeah, by accident. Yeah. You better feel called, you <laughs> know, right. to go to that area. <laughs> That's right. And uh, great people that live down there. In fact, one of my neighbors down there, I had a good friend named Kevin Sanders and his dad was the national PBR uh, champion. 1983 had a huge mural in his house of this uh, of this ride and I remember developing friendships with him because he was a deacon in our church yeah a uh, really great guy um, and he just kind of showed what hard work and discipline but he also was a family man and it was kind of neat seeing that from other men not just my dad and I think that's a big thing within church life that you do spot mm -hmm. people who they live out their faith yeah now venturing on from Wachula though <laughs> uh, I went to Eustis by the time I was in fifth grade yeah and uh, right off the bat, I met a guy named uh, Michael Monteith. Oh, yeah. He Michael? lives in this area. Uh, mm -hmm. He's a wealth advisor um, in the villages now. But what's funny is that his dad uh, was head deacon of our church, <laughs> and I'm the pastor's kid, and we're th about the same age. We're a year different. And we grew up playing baseball together, went to church together, got in trouble together, you mm -hmm. know, all yeah. those different things. But I'm here in fifth grade. And I can tell you it was not an easy process, and we're getting some of this, but yeah, you know, I came here, I'm completely deaf in my right ear, completely. Mm. Born that way, uh, have a dead nerve there. So um, it's got good parts, because I can fall asleep on the good side, yeah. and I don't hear a thing. <laughs> and I tell my wife, if she whispers in that ear, all I know is that it's sweet nothings. <laughs> and uh, the truth is that uh, what that did, though, is it caused some hardship, being that I had speech impediment. 
mm-hmm. due to it. I didn't hear things. I didn't know how to enunciate stuff uh, correctly. And over time, that can become a very much a hindrance in life. Yeah. And uh, But I'll talk about how God took that and used it to mold me and get me to where I'm at now. During those middle school years, I went to Blue Lake Academy mm-hmm. here mm-hmm. local. You know, all the local people they know, uh, that was where First Pass Church from Eustace is. Now it's called Life Point. Mm-hmm. And uh, I actually play basketball there, and I'm only five foot seven. Yeah. So me playing basketball, that's like a conundrum wrapped in an enigma <laughs> thrown into a quagmire. <laughs> yeah. You know, it just, uh, that does not make sense. You become a three point midpoint shot. That's right. I can tell you this we did have a, a boy on that team. His name was Agila Chukua. Obi Wan Fu in the Machukuwa, <laughs> and uh, we called him AJ for short. <laughs> I bet you that was that was that. And uh, so from uh, that middle school time on to high school, went to Eustis High School right here, right where we're uh, sitting. I never took any production classes. Now that I'm here, I wish I would have. Oh uh, yeah. Number number one, uh, I was actually talking to you before this uh, how I wish I would taken uh, some of the culinary classes as well. Mm-hmm. Yes. But I was busy playing football mm-hmm. and baseball. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was around here for the championship team that was in 2004, yeah. I believe, and they had another one back in 2000, if I'm not mm-hmm. mistaken. Mm-hmm. But I say all that to let everyone know this listening, I am not proficient at all in sports, really. <laughs> I feel like the coach just brought me on because they felt sorry for me. <laughs> but I played JV uh, football, played JV baseball, I never went up to varsity. Mm-hmm. Uh, my dad told me if I wanted a truck at 16, I had to go out and buy it. Mm. And I had to work to keep it. Oh, wow. So I, um, that's what started my time in the funeral business. Mm. I know what you're thinking. A 16-year-old in the funeral <laughs> yeah. business. Yeah. Uh, what in the world did he do? Well, exactly. Range, I mean, that's insane, yeah. crazy stuff. Yeah. Following that, after high school, uh, I went to Lake Sumter, mm-hmm. did my two years there. Worked on math all the time, it seemed like, <laughs> while I was there. You know, English and reading, those things came natural. But math was, uh, I learned discipline by having to go through those math labs and learn all the time. Yeah, and you are not alone. No. <laughs> I, I feel like you ask most people, what was your struggle? They say math. Yeah. I yeah. go, I'm there with you, buddy. More than not. Right. And now, to just fast forward real quick, went on to college at Carson Newman College after Lake Sumter, got my BA in religion. And it was interesting there because um, they were more moderate to liberal. So I dealt with some scholars who would say, you know, the first 12 chapters of Genesis are not relevant. literal, not yeah. relevant. Mm-hmm. They're just a good story. And I think if you don't have a historical Adam in Genesis, the one who said that he sinned against God and it says an Adam all die in scripture, mm-hmm. but through the second Adam being Jesus, mm-hmm. that's how all can have life. Yeah. So it's kind of a, a very important part of the Bible that he is a real historical person. Yes. So I learned to read people I did not agree with, but I would recommend that to anybody. And for mm-hmm. youth pastors, read people you do not agree with. Mm-hmm. You know, there read you people because the truth of the matter, if you're always reading the same type of people, you're only going to speak to a certain crowd. Yes, yes. And, and I like, I'm glad you brought that up because mentorship, we always talk about, man, and we hear people say it because when I grew up, you didn't talk about mentors. You had mentors, but nobody talked about a mentor. That was something unusual. But now we talk about mentorships and everybody's going, everybody needs a mentor and that sort of thing. And John Maxwell, Dr. Maxwell, who's big on leadership, he said, never have just one mentor. Mm. You want to have multiple mentors because if you have one mentor, you're going to get as good and as bad. <laughs> so if you have multiples, right. just take the good and, and leave them alone. When they start their bad stuff, just leave that alone. You know. But yes, go ahead. Here's the thing. I left something out. Between Lake Sumter and between Carson Newman, I went to Southeastern University in Lakeland, Florida. Yeah. And their Assemblies of God school. And here I am, a Southern Baptist, yeah. at Assemblies of God school. And I learned to love those people. I learned they love Jesus. At the same time, it made me dive into why am I even, why do I believe the way I believe? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, it made me search deeper into why I believe mm-hmm. what I believe. And I would just say, always be willing when you're confronted with something to also search out why do I believe the way I believe? Mm-hmm. So right. that way, when people ask you that question, uh, you can have convictions and you can speak with truth and grace. Well, it also helps because you're thinking about how these people think. There's a reason they think that way. Right. They're, they're not just that way because all of a sudden one day they woke up and said, hey, I'm going to be, I'm going to not believe this or I'm going to believe this. Right. And so uh, it, it helps you to have compassion for people. Yeah. In fact, I can remember um, that was the actually while I was there at Southeast University in Lakeland, Florida, mm-hmm. that was the first place I ever preached 
and <laughs> I was it was at First Baptist Church of Lakeland Church at the mall. Mm-hmm. In their their they actually had a movie theater. Mm-hmm. A movie theater is where they preached to the college age and twenty somethings. Oh wow! And they allowed me to actually preach at that young age. I was I've been about twenty. Yeah. Now hear me on okay. this. I had to submit an outline. To, so they could look over and say, well, this guy's not preaching any heresy. We'll let, we'll let him go. <laughs> but I preached um, from Matthew eleven twenty nine, which I can still remember. It says, take my yoke upon you. Learn mm-hmm. of me. Be meek and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. Mm-hmm. Only preached 17 minutes. <laughs> 17 minutes. But you know what? After that sermon, I had a few people come to me and said, I can't believe that was your first sermon. And that made me say, well, I guess I'll do a second. They can't believe that's my first <laughs> one. And I, did, I was allowed that later on. And moving from there... And going to Carson Newman, I had a mentor while I was at Carson Newman, mm-hmm. a guy named Mark Parton. And, and Mark Parton, he was from the hills of La Follette, Tennessee. Yeah. Okay, so Carson Newman's in Jefferson City, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. And Mark Parton, while he's there, he takes me under his wing. I, I come to him That's and great. I said, man, I would love to study under you and just be around you and see what you're doing. Because, I mean, this guy was out sharing the gospel. He's speaking revivals. I mean, the man could pray. It felt like he came to the throne room of God. Mm-hmm. And uh, here he is, uh, this um, 57-year-old man. Here I am, a 20-year-old, really. And he takes me under his wing. And he says, man, I just want you to, you know, he'll go to life and say, Josh, why don't you come with me today? He just, he just take me along with him in life. And I learned from him to just let people be a part of your life. Take them along with you. Mm-hmm. And, um, from doing that, he would not just tell me, Josh, you need to pray, tell me you read your Bible, tell me to go share the gospel. Mm-hmm. He would show me. Mm-hmm. He would take me with him. I would share the gospel with somebody, but first I've watched him share. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I learned how to pray because I saw this guy who would be on his knees and they would write out prayer requests, mm. him and a group of men, and they would just pray through that list. Wow. And so I got to see firsthand, I got to see revival happen in that church where on the third song, on a Sunday morning, people just come down to the altar weeping wow. before God. Wow. Uh, I saw schools changing where kids were repenting in the school system. Mm-hmm. I mean, because a real revival, it's not just changing the church, it's changing the community. Mm-hmm. It's uh, people actually saying, hey, there's something far greater and far better. And if Jesus is enough, then what, what they're basically saying is that if I'm in all my work and all my goodness, I still when I'm tying myself up by my own bootstraps, trying mm-hmm. to pull myself up by my own bootstraps, mm-hmm. and life still feels empty, no joy. Yeah, uh, They're pointing people towards the one who can give joy, the fullness of it. Yeah. So that was huge to be mentored at that age. Because like I said, I was at Carson Newman where they had some theology that was incongruent mm-hmm. uh, with some things. Mm-hmm. But I needed that. I needed mm-hmm. that time. Then I went to Southeastern University and I had conservative teaching mm-hmm. and scholars that were amazing. And so I could finally kind of drop that sword and just listen. Mm-hmm. And it was a great time. Um, it really edified me. And But I would encourage all youth pastors, once again, not to be scared of going to the place that will be difficult and hard. Mm-hmm. And, um, and learning who to read. Because I know this. My life has been really formed by the places I've gone, the people I've met, and the books I read. Mm-hmm. Yes. My life has been really formed by those three things. Mm-hmm. And here's the thing is I know that coming back here and because this is hometown, you know, I went on yeah. to school. I went on to North Carolina where I did my master's work and I was, I was doing all this stuff. And here I am back home and to get back in this place and to reach people from your own hometown. Sometimes it's scary to go back home. Yes, it is. Yes. You know, I think about um, the demon possessed man that Jesus mm-hmm. that cast out the demons. You know, he said, he said, uh, he said I'll follow you. I bet he would follow them to the ends of the earth mm-hmm. with Jesus. Jesus told him, no, go back home. Mm. I mean, these people have seen his, uh, his bad side, right? Mm-hmm. Here's, this, here's this demon-possessed guy that is uh, casting himself upon the rocks. Mm-hmm. Here's this guy that is um, breaking chains, putting mm-hmm. fear in people. Mm-hmm. And he told him, go back home. To yeah, place the guy probably were. felt like, yeah, I don't want to go back there. These guys, they're not going to believe me. Right. They're, and some people really probably still hate him. I know. Yeah. And at the same time, I get, uh, it's funny, a, a friend of mine, he works at Lake Tire and Auto, Matt Smith, he told me that he said, guys come in there and he said, oh, you know, our youth pastor over at First Pass Mount Door, Josh Douglas. And they go, Josh, 
youth pastor. <laughs> you know, um, there's this old saying with uh, pastor's kids, we're the mischievous ones, we're the worst ones. Right, right. And right. Uh, and, and sometimes us brothers, you know, I mean, we like I said, we were rough guys. I mean, we we're brothers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, my dad built us to be, uh, he wants to be men, wants to be warriors. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, that's why when we play football, we like to hit hard. You yeah. know, yeah. we went hunting, we want to get, if it's brown, it's down. That's what we said, you know. <laughs> And oh, man. we just, you know, we all enjoyed and we wrestled. I mean, we were, we were tough kids. And at the yeah. same time, um, we're the type, you know, uh, hey, you say something to mama, might have to knock your teeth in or something. Uh. You know, we're, those, <laughs> we're those type of guys. But at the same time, dad also taught us, you know, that there's people who are hurting mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh, who need people to come alongside them and just care for them. Yeah. You know, um, I find it interesting in scripture you get the verse Peter and it says, cast all your anxieties upon me because mm-hmm. he cares for you. This is interesting. In my life, I've seen a, a lot of death. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And for youth pastors, this is critical. Walking with people through death, that passage of scripture has helped me more than anything. And here's why. Mm-hmm. When I cast all my anxieties upon Jesus, he doesn't say, because I know what you feel, even though he could. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what I've learned is when somebody dies from cancer or somebody loses a child or somebody goes through something i can't feel what they feel i just Mm -hmm. can't Mm -hmm. even if i've been through it let's say that i knew someone that had cancer and i've been through cancer i still don't have the same disposition as them Mm -hmm. i still actually can't fully identify yeah but here's what i know i can do i can care Mm -hmm. and one of the places we see this best that people just naturally do it is burn victims Mm mm-hmm Burn victims, they don't say to them, I know what you're feeling. Nobody does. Mm-mm. Not unless Instead, you've been a burn victim. That's right. Yeah. Instead, what they do is they say, can I, can I take care of your bandages? Can I, can I help you move? Can I, help, can I feed you? They, they naturally go towards that. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, people going through pain and death, you know, there's a difference between saying that you feel what they feel, and then you say, I feel for you. Mm-hmm. Because I can't feel what somebody else feels, but I can feel for them and I can say, I care about you. Mm -hmm. Sympathy. Sympathy. Yeah. Coming alongside and saying, you're worth my time. Mm -hmm. You're worth this effort. And you don't have to sit there and, and, you know, it's like what I tell a student, I love you. Mm -hmm. I tell I don't want anything Mm -hmm. in return. Yeah. Yeah. And they can't believe that. I I don't want anything in return. Mm -hmm. I just want you to know that somebody cares for you. Yeah. And in time, I proved that to them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, at first, they might be a little suspect. Yes. And, you know, to all youth pastors, you know, that's good. Let them be suspect. Mm-hmm. But let them show that there's validity to what you are saying. Mm-hmm. That they're finally, that you will show them that there's truth here. Yeah. Going all these circles, I'm just thinking about, you know, I, I backtracking here. Fifth grade, I told you I moved here. Mm-hmm. And I told you, uh, one, that when I was in that age, and you got to understand, I'm just about to go to middle school, it's fifth grade summer. And I got this speech impediment. I'm mm-hmm. in a new pl- location, new school, Blue Lake Academy. And at that place, here I am, and I got people that think, man, this guy can't talk. <laughs> and look at me now, here I am, God's put me in places where I'm talking, I'm speaking mm-hmm. for a living. Mm-hmm. And even backtrack further, when I was in fourth grade, um, the speech impediment, it was a time of, it showed real in, incompetence in my life where I felt like I wasn't competent, mm-hmm. which is being before people. And, and here's the deal. Everyone wants to feel accepted. Everyone wants to feel loved. And what this has taught me, what I'm about to go into, I have students that do not feel competent in a lot of areas. Mm-hmm. I have students that question a lot of things in their life. Mm-hmm. That they just have hardships mm-hmm. and they don't feel that. They feel that there's some things going on in their life, this could be the end of me. Now, looking back, the speech impediment was a little thing, but God used it to move mountains in my life. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And one of the things that he did, so when I was in fourth grade, I heard myself on Wildcat TV down there in Wachula. Yeah. You know, they were the Wildcats, and I heard myself speak on, the, on that school TV, and it was absolutely horrid. Mm-hmm. I was thinking, that's what I sound like? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Mm. And here's the deal. Fast track, ninth grade. Gone through middle school, had the speech impediment, still found friends, still um, God used it to, you know, I played basketball. Still, I didn't let it make so I didn't do anything, but I was still always hesitant to speak. Well, speaking is one of the biggest fears of most people. And, and yet, uh, when I was looking at a thing about success on YouTube, the number one way to be successful is learn to speak publicly. Mm. 
So yeah, very, very difficult task and a very necessary task. Go right, ahead. and I, I know that, like I said, speaking with um, conviction and passion, mm-hmm. but also learning um, whether it's the, you know, when to raise my voice, when to lower it, when the, mm-hmm. you know, all these things came in time, but just getting in front of people and then my peers. You know, I think even today, sometimes the hardest people to get in front of is peers. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And here I am in ninth grade, about to give a presentation in English class. And, I, and the night before, I'm staying up all night. I'm studying this thing. It's only probably seven minutes. And it is wrecking me. <laughs> and I get up there and I, I do my best I can. And uh, I, I feel there's a flow to it. There's, you know, everything's going well. And I get done. I'm, I'm thinking, man, how is this received? Mm-hmm. You know, everyone wants to know how, how are they received. Right. You know, people want to know that. Mm-hmm. And I remember a few people came up to me after and said, Josh, that was good. I can't believe that. <laughs> and it gave me confidence instead of feeling incompetent. I finally mm-hmm. felt confident about this. And it moved me towards a place where I, I knew that God was doing a few things at this time. Mm-hmm. Ninth grade, that happened. Tenth grade, I start working for a funeral home. Like I said, I'm only playing JV football right, and baseball right. i'm thinking well this is not going to be my professional career right yeah you know, that's not happening <laughs> and i wanted to buy that truck and at the same time you know i was thinking i gotta get a truck i get a girlfriend you know all these things gotta come together right right and uh so i got the nice truck instead i just got debt and no girlfriend you <laughs> know well i go to work at hardin poly funeral home mm-hmm. here i am in 10th grade you know i'm washing cars in a full suit mm. um mm. i am uh, actually out there during the services, like visitations, opening car doors for people, mm. and you know, um, opening the door at the front of the offices and the building, and and I'm just talking with people, getting to know them, and and here's the amazing thing, God was slowly teaching me just to be a presence in people who are hurting, mm. just yeah. to be there, just to show up. Mm. But He was doing something else. I also had the hard task of going on removals, and removal is anybody that has passed away. Mm-hmm. And this particular removal, when I was 16 years old, um, it was an eight-year-old girl who had hydrocephalus, that swelling of the brain. She passed away at her parents' home. And I went to the resident's house. I remember we had the cot. We had this nice bl- blanket that goes with it, this quilt. And we brought it um, towards the door. And the family actually met us at the door. Generally, we come inside, we talk with them, but they came right out. And, and the dad had that little girl in his arms. Mm, mm. The mother was there. They laid her on that cot, and I could see the mother stroking her little daughter. I mean, life had just left her. Mm-hmm. But to them, that was their little baby. That was their yeah. girl. Yeah. And I remember um, the mother stroking back the hair. And she kisses her daughter on the forehead. She says, your mama loves you so much and misses you so much. Mm. And I can't wait to see you in our forever home. Mm. I'm 16 years old. Yeah. And this is what kind of propelled me towards the ministry right in that moment is that mm-hmm. I realized people need a hope that's beyond the grave and death. Yes. And, you know, I grew up in the church. I, I knew these things. I, but this is when you felt it. Mm-hmm. And there's some things that can't always be taught it has to be felt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and in that moment, I felt the weight of the hope of Christ. And all my students if I want them to have a passion for who Jesus is and their heart to have a heartbeat for who he is, there's some things that they just have to feel and be around and be in ministry type settings to do. For instance, sharing the gospel. Mm -hmm. There is something about sharing Jesus and you see somebody's walls just break down Mm -hmm. and they just completely surrender saying, I've never heard anything like this. Mm -hmm. Because you tell me something else in this life that can overcome death and that can defeat sin. Mm. And that's amazing to think about. What else is there? Yes. Now, that moment, it's not like right there I just said, boom, I'm going to the ministry. I stuck mm-hmm. in the funeral home business for a long time. Even put myself through uh, college up into Tennessee. I was in the hills of Tennessee doing funerals. <laughs> and uh, down in Florida, they didn't have them in people's houses. But there, it did happen. Oh, yeah. And uh, But in grief, two things for youth pastors about reaching people with the gospel and teaching students to share the gospel. And I really learned this from sports and from funeral work. So all this has come together. Mm-hmm. Speak to people in their passion and in their pain. Mm-hmm. Their passion and in their pain. Mm-hmm. And it's true, C.S. Lewis said that God will get our attention. 
he uses pain as a megaphone. Mm. Yes. Mm. As a megaphone. Mm-hmm. And during those times, people are more acute in what they listen to mm-hmm. and even what they feel. Yeah. And I'm not talking about manipulation, but I'm talking about pointing them to the one thing that makes it that he says one day every There'll be no more tears. Mm-hmm. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more mourning. There'll be no more death. And he says, behold, I make all things new. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is the thing that to point people from their pain to the reality that I'm going to restore all things. Mm-hmm. It's huge that we get students to understand um, the very thing that they have a problem with right now, the very thing that they worry about, the very thing that um, causes anxiety or the very thing that hurts their hearts. Mm-hmm. Even 30, 40 years from now, it may hurt their heart. Because mm-hmm. we never move on from losses, but we move forward. Mm. And what I'm learning is that we move forward how? By having a hope that's beyond those losses. The other thing is finding people's passion. Mm-hmm. And passion matters because for most people, they're letting you into their heart. Mm-hmm. They're letting you into how their their mind is wired Mm -hmm. and the very thing that drives them towards something. Mm -hmm. And here's the deal. I've known a lot of people that have passions that are very temporary things that they're driving their full self towards. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, sports are a good thing. Mm -hmm. What I've learned is that they make a terrible God. Yeah. You know, my wife even, my wife, she's a wonderful thing. She's a good thing. But your spouse can make a terrible God. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in fact, just even sitting here, my my tummy is growling. If food is your mm-hmm. is your god, I mean it's a good thing, but it can make a terrible god. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Whatever it is that your heart gravitates towards, in our passions, if it overdoes the ultimate thing, mm-hmm. well, that's anything we love more than Jesus is an idol. Mm-hmm. And so, for instance, um, I got this from Mark Driscoll one time. I know that he's a name uh, that mm-hmm. for some people they don't like to hear, but at the same time, he did have a lot of things that he said that were good. Mm-hmm. And one of the things he said, he was in a foreign country. Mm-hmm. And he was talking to this uh, lady, and he said, well, look, y'all have the chicken god that you, uh, you cut off the head of the chicken, and mm-hmm. you worship that, and, and then you got the, the god of this rock where this lightning hit, and you worship the rock god. And mm-hmm. he said, you know, all this, all this animism, all this idolatry here, this woman looked at her and said, you have more idolatry in America than you could ever believe. Mm -hmm. They said, you know, we build these huge stadiums where you all gather together to worship looking Mm -hmm. down on this field. Mm -hmm. They said, um, we actually uh, have the gods on every corner where we feed our tummies being the restaurants. Yes. And then he went on to say, and then at night we all gather around our worship pavilion being our couches to look at the TV. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it was interesting because our hearts are idol factories and we never mm-hmm. see, we have blinders to a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I think through living this life, look for those things that are, cause emptiness in the sense that they can't have the fullness of joy. Mm-hmm. They can't keep their promises, but look towards something that can keep its promises. Mm-hmm. And I'll just ask, you know, all youth pastors, you know, what are you pointing your students toward that will keep its promises? Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. important. Yeah, and I'm reading a book right now called Whisper by Mark Batterson. You were talking about grief is one way that we can actually listen. We're broken down. And so all of a sudden we're, we're receptive to a lot of things. And the book Whisper, it talks about that God is speaking all the time, but we are so busy and have so many sounds and noises our you know we have it guys now we hire for industry and stuff because we want to keep our our phones our cell phones are our, our texting our our ability on the computer and if they break down it's like our entire world falls apart and he said that in studying even in science that a whisper catches people's attention more than the loud sounds and that's why uh, that we hear god more in the whisper than we do in any other way and that our ears are oriented and you're talking about you being deaf in one ear right and he said the tomatus effect uh, was a dr tomatus who found out an opera singer could not hit certain normal notes a famous opera singer and other doctors thought it was something he realized 
that he was singing so loudly that it made him go deaf in certain parts of his frequency levels. And so those normal sounds, his ear's reception to it was gone. And so we we have these noisy things in our life, all these things that are happening, all these things that we are doing to block it out that are idols we're talking about, that one thing that he does, he, he does a silent retreat for two days. And that silent retreat allows his ears, his mind, his spirit, his body to reset. Mm. And that resetting allows us to hear what we had forgotten to hear, forgotten that we actually could hear at one time. And I, I do this with my children now, my wife, uh, because I was so busy in student ministry. And guys, you'll get too busy and you'll, you'll block out the things you love most and not even realize it. And I realized it, but then I would forget and go back and forth. I started saying, I'm going to look at my children's eyes. Make sure that when I'm speaking to them, I'm looking to their eyes. When my wife, looking to her eyes. And one thing about communication is that people get and lose jobs because they're either looking into that interviewer's eyes or they're not. They say, don't do it too much, <laughs> but, but be receptive yeah, to where gaze, you're looking. Right, don't, don't gaze, gaze. <laughs> but you want to. But I noticed that, that if I was not looking at their eyes, I could not hear really what they were saying. Tell me about yeah. your wife, how you met her. Well, my wife's name is Julie, mm -hmm. and we're actually 26 weeks uh, pregnant with our first child. Awesome. Congra uh, congratulations. We're having, we're having a son, name him Titus. Titus Lee Douglas, and uh, we chose Titus actually because Paul, when he sent Titus to Church of Crete, he said, mm. I want you to do two things. I want you to rebuke them. I want you to encourage them. Mm. And uh, we want a son that will do hard things, even go to the hard places and uh, stand on truth, but also give people grace because mm. everyone needs that. And I know that I needed that quite a bit in my life. Mm -hmm. And students do as well. How, how did you have to track her down to, well, to get her to go out with you? I found her in at church I went to. I went to Bayleaf Baptist Church up in Raleigh, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And while I was there, I met her. I talked with her, and she wouldn't have anything to do with me. Mm -hmm. Not a thing. Mm -hmm. She was she was heading towards the mission field, mm -hmm. and uh, she was doing her work at Southeastern Seminary where I was at as well up there. And while she was in chapel, I sat next to her. I said, "Hey, um, she's got back from a mission trip in China." I said, "I would love to sit down and just talk with you about China." Now, that wasn't my full intention. Mm -hmm. You know, I, right. I had ulterior motives. Well, we're guys. We do that. That's right. right. <laughs> and she must know. I said, look, I'll even buy your meal from Chick-fil-A. You know? Right. High class. That's right. right. That's right. Who, who doesn't like that chicken? Top restaurant. That's right. That's about as Christian as it gets, isn't it? <laughs> Chick-fil-A, closed on Sundays for those. And, you know, I just, I went full board that route. Well, I sat there and met her at Chick-fil-A. She met me. So she actually showed up. That was a good sign. That was good bought her some of that, you know, chicken. Mm. We sat down and we started talking. She told me a little bit about China, told me about her passion, told me about things she was doing. I mean, she led people to the Lord while she was there. I was thinking, man, anybody that can find this woman, that would be phenomenal for them. Mm -hmm. And I just told her after that conversation, I said, look, I didn't just come here to talk about China. Uh, I said, I also came here to let you know, that I like you. Mm. I said, and I like you and want to see where this relationship go if we had a relationship. So I'm a Christian guy, you're a Christian girl, why not? And mm -hmm. that was the best I could give at that moment. I said, but here's the deal. I don't want you to give me an answer right now. I don't want to put you on the spot. I just want to let you know that's where I'm at. So mm -hmm. there, was, there was no question in her mind. I said, I'm, I'm pursuing. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I just want to see where this could go. Well, after that, she actually got in my car with me, drove around for a little bit, listened to music. She asked me questions about my family and my life. And then she realized she went to Baptist College of Florida. Mm. And my brother went there as well and met his wife there. So she knew some of my family and was kind of neat how everything came full circle. Mm -hmm. But in the end, I guess my charm won out and she decided to marry me. <laughs> and in fact, uh, during our engagement, when I asked her to marry me, we had cops that showed up there because I took her to a park after hours because uh. it was where I took her one time and mm -hmm. uh, it was a beautiful scene. And I knew she would remember it. But as it turns out, you can't be there after hours. <laughs> and fortunately, when they ca came up to us, I said, sir, can I talk to you privately for a moment? 
And uh, he said, yeah, I said, look, I said, we're not down here for any odd reason. You know, there's not drugs or anything like that. But I'm asking her if she wants to marry me. <laughs> and that caused, oh, oh, and he actually got on his uh, radio and told all the cops, hey, there's some people down here he's proposing. <laughs> so I finally got the blue on my side, you know. <laughs> right. But when I got back to her, I said, as the cop drove off, I said, well, I took care of that. <laughs> and uh, she laughs now, knowing what really transpired. <laughs> but she's been... Um, a rock in a lot of ways she is uh she loves jesus but uh, she ministers to women well and uh, mm -hmm. her, people are hurting i know that um one of the things that you wanted to talk with me about was one of my worst days in ministry mm -hmm. yes. and you know i can tell you me and my wife so here we are with our 26 weeks in the womb and you know very much um loving this time period but you know like many people We've gone through miscarriages. Mm, okay. And I can remember I worked for a factory in North Carolina, Walmart Distribution Center. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking those hard work, packing and stacking boxes. Yeah. And Where I, Jesus would have worked. That's probably. right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. You know, I wore a, a, a belt <laughs> around to protect that back. I drove a double, double jack hydraulic. And here's the deal. I stacked boxes for 11 hours, 60 pounds to 100 pound boxes as high as a semi truck door, wow. uh, one trip after the other. I remember I'm at that doing that factory work, and it's a it's a late day, and uh, she calls me. It was the first time we we lost our child, and it was about you know seven weeks in our pregnancy. It wasn't that long. Mm. I mean, we just really found out baby was gone. Mm. And I remember driving home thinking, what am I going to say to my wife? How am I going? You know, nobody really prepares you for that in ministry. Nobody prepares you for that, for that in marriage. Right. And in fact, my parents never went through one. Her parents never went through one. Mm -hmm. It was kind of an oddity for us to go through. Mm -hmm. And I can just remember getting home, coming up to her, and just holding her. Mm. And just her weeping on my chest. Just wow. being there for her presence, being a presence to her, and just um, saying, I'm here. Mm -hmm. And this hurts. And you know what? Sometimes the best thing you can do in a high, high stress situation, uh, an intense moment, like that it's just to say i'm here and this hurts yeah yeah and you know i can remember for me the ebb and flow of pain and grief for me it didn't hit all that day it was the next day i was doing dishes and my wife signed up and i'm doing helping her with that stuff and i just start weeping because mm. i'm just thinking that's a life yeah you know that's yeah. that's my child that who knows what that could have been but you know i tell people all the time part of what comforts us in grief is the words like the scripture says comfort each other with these words we shall see you again mm. Yeah. And so that was that was a very hard day in ministry because here I am, me and my wife, uh, really, I mean, newlyweds, uh, going towards the ministry with each other. We're, at that time, we were looking towards going to the International Mission Board. Mm -hmm. And we both want a family. She wants to be a mama. I want to be a daddy. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, um, you're dealing with the loss of something that she felt more acutely because she was pregnant with that. Mm -hmm. And she felt the changing Mm -hmm. And we all know that the point of pregnancy, why they can go through the labor pains, mm -hmm. is the joy at the end. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. hardship of that is that there's not that joy at the end in the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, that so makes sense. Th that was a hard day. But since then, I've, I've dealt with other people who have gone through the same struggle and uh, walked with them through that in the midst of suffering. And here's what I'm learning. Mm -hmm. You have to go through a crucifixion before you get to the resurrection. And that was a moment that we went through a crucifixion. And in a real way, I believe one day we'll see the resurrection. Yeah, there's a, there was a movie, a true story about a, a boy, I can't even remember the title, a pastor's son, in fact, had an appendicitis or some attack or something, a young boy. And, Insanity and, of God, Nick Ripkin? Uh, um, no, no, but, but it's he, he did not die, but he did end up in Jesus' presence and the mm. presence of angels, and this little girl kept running up to him. She said, she's really annoying me. I tried to get her to stay <laughs> away, and he talked about the reality of it. She said, I'm so excited to see you. I'm so excited to see you. And he says, well, who are you? And she says, well, I'm your sister. <laughs> and so when he wakes up, and, of course, the parents are in just beside themselves in grief, and and one way that the dad knew he was, uh, who's a pastor, really knew that he had an out-of-body experience. He was in the presence of God, he says, Dad, he said, when I was 
in the operating room, I saw you in the chapel screaming at God because he was very angry at God. And his dad was just screaming at God, just going, why are you doing this? You know, save my son, that sort of thing. And his dad knew there's no way he could have known. The second thing he did was he said, by the way, I saw my sister. They knew they'd never told him they'd ever had a miscarriage. Wow. And this was a miscarriage. He told them her name. And they said that was her name. <laughs> That's what we what we named her. And I can't can't remember the name of the movie, but it was popular and it was out for quite a while. It wasn't the one you're. Yeah, you, you said, know, well, I've one. learned sometimes too with things like that. Yeah, it's helped in the midst of pain and suffering. Mm-hmm. Sometimes my um, so for my wife, her heart pulls her head along. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sometimes for me, my head pulls my heart along. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we're just built differently. Yeah. By the way, guys, women, and men are different. If you didn't know that, <laughs> you need to do some research. And even with students, they when you're dealing are, with women, dealing with men, yep. I got to where I did not try to counsel any of my girls. I finally got a clue. Yep. Uh, my volunteers, my wife, or, or I would always get lady volunteers, and they de- dealt with them. And there's a clue there, guys. You think you understand, you even when you've heard everything they've said, you wrote it down. You said, "No, I get this." You do not. You don't get it, <laughs> and yep. you did not hear what wise you thought words. you heard. Very right, wise exactly. words. Go ahead, though. So what I needed, you know, I went through scripture and I found one, uh, the children of Israel. Mm-hmm. The ones who were of the younger generation, the Bible says, for they did not know evil. Mm. They were allowed into the promised land. Mm. The younger ones. The wow. other side, of course, was King David. When his son dies, he says, where you go, I soon will go. Mm. But you will not return. And, um, wow. you know, he's not talking about the grave. He's talking about um, paradise. He's talking mm-hmm. about, I mean, there's no other, in that context, it doesn't make sense. And these are two key texts for finding comfort mm-hmm. in life, such grief. And the same thing with, I say, you got to go through a crucifixion to get to the resurrection. Mm-hmm. That part that I thought you were talking about, Nick Ripkin, the book Insanity of God, mm-hmm. his son dies from asthma, an asthma attack. Mm-hmm. They're in overseas. Mm. I mean, these are Americans who went overseas to do mission work and they're in a house that's moldy, it starts raining, oh. the mold gets worse, the kid has an asthma attack mm. and dies on the way to the hospital. Oh, no. And he's, you know, no, I hadn't heard that one. And, and the hard thing is, you can play in your mind over and over again, well, if we would have never gone to the mission field, mm-hmm. right. we never done this. Yeah, and God, why? You know, hey, I'm doing all this stuff for you. That's right. How could you treat us this way? Don't you love me? Mm-hmm. And uh, it's the same question the thief on the cross asks mm-hmm. when he says, if you are God, save yourself. Prove, prove to us you're God. Right. One was one way, one was the That's other right. way. One was the other way. Mm-hmm. And the other one said, don't you realize who you're talking to? And it's interesting. The other one, he humbles his heart to the point that he says, Lord, could you, would you let me be with you in paradise? Mm. And here's the interesting thing. Here's what I'm learning even through pain, even through our passion, even through talking to students. Jesus does not remind that man or tells him, well, you got to go memorize this passage or you got you to do this first. Mm-hmm. Instead, no, he reminds him of his faithfulness being Jesus' faithfulness. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He says, today you'll be with me. Mm-hmm. And I find that even with the woman that had the blood problem in scripture, mm-hmm. he doesn't remind her of her sin or how mm-hmm, she should mm-hmm. be ashamed for coming out and touching a man with that blood problem, mm-hmm. making everyone unclean. No, he reminds her of her faith. And so often students in the midst of pain or in the midst of their passion or, you know, let's focus on pain here for a second. They may think, well, all this stuff's happening because I did this Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or because these things or God, do you really love me? Mm -hmm. And all the while God is sitting there pursuing them in a way just like the prodigal son. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's something about that, that a son who leaves his father and takes the inheritance. Here's what's amazing. He was basically saying to the father. I wish you were dead so I could have my money by taking it early instead of waiting. Yes. And when he runs off and he does his own thing and spends it in an unwise way and he comes back, instead of the father making his son a indebted servant that has to pay off a debt mm-hmm. or a slave, he puts a signet ring and he puts a robe around his son saying, come home. Mm-hmm. You're part of my family. You are a son of the Most High. Mm-hmm. I think... Men and women need to hear that. You are a son or daughter of the Most High God. And when I did all the sinning, he did all the saving. 
Mm. And Jesus is the only one I know most people, when I'm sinning, they want to push me away. Yeah. They don't want to be near that. But really, Jesus, when we're in sin, I mean, the type of sin that breaks people, mm-hmm. the type of sin mm-hmm. that causes a ripple effect that unearths you know, everything in someone's life, Jesus mm-hmm. pursues you. Mm-hmm. And when students get to know that Jesus, the one that pursues them in all their deficiencies, in all their hangups, and all their heartaches, that changes them. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. they hear a story, a narrative, that it's not how good they are, it's how good he is. It's not, if I obey, then he'll love me. It's he loves me. Mm-hmm. So I obey. And we're going to go toward this death, dying, and resurrection thing because Mm -hmm. my editor, Michael Helms, and my son, Ryan Edwards, they've often said, you know, you need to go do that because I dealt with a lot of of death and dying. Didn't want to. (laughs) In fact, uh, the night I asked my wife to marry me, it was her birthday. And by the way, we had been broken up. (laughs) (laughs) And so my way of asking her if we could still go out again was I asked her to marry me. Right. She says, I'll think about it, but I'll keep the ring. And so she did. So she was the only one who knew. She, at 1 a.m., I get a phone call. She says, you've got to go to Ocala. I was in Orlando getting ready for a meeting the next day, staying over with a friend. 1 a.m., you got to go to Ocala. Michael has collapsed. He was the quarterback of the football team. Michael had asked wow. Jesus in his heart that summer. Uh, come to find out later, he had shared Christ with over 75 of his friends. He was the who's who on campus. But he had had a dream Thursday night. I saw him Friday morning, just ran into him on the, uh, this great thing about youth pastors, you're going on to campus. Right. You don't know a lot of stuff if you're not there just to help not there for an agenda, yeah. but there to, how can you help the teacher's administration be there for students instead of your agenda? And so I'm walking to the parking lot, going to um, West Campus was opening up for students, and I saw him, and Michael was always a happy, happy guy. And so he was not happy that morning. I said, hey, what, what's up? He says, oh, just, you know, some things, just I don't want to talk about it or whatever. I walked him to class. It's the last time I saw him alive. And so the football game was that night. What had happened, he had had a dream Thursday night that after halftime, something was going to happen to him. And it didn't look good. Told his girlfriend. Told his best friend. He didn't tell me. I had no clue. And she made him promise that at halftime, he would come off the field. And that we'd not play the second half. Well, that happened. But what happened is he walked off the field immediately collapsed and went into uh, a coma because he had had a brain aneurysm. Unreal. Yes, exactly. And my wife, so here's how we're starting off our future, you know, in marriage. You know, I asked her to marry me. We've been broken up. It's her birthday. This is not really a happy time that night. <laughs> it's, a, it's a questioning time for her. 1 a.m., I get a call. One of my students is dying. And so I go to a Cala. And she's the only one who knows where I am. And I go to Acala, and uh, we go through this process. So our engagement was going through the process of a funeral from a student that we loved. Mm. And it takes off from there, move up to Eustace. And we go through uh, so many deaths of students. And one death a year is too much. And but we're going through about that, at least one death of a senior usually, or a freshman in college, it seems like those times of years in high school, I don't know why, it seems like that's when students have died. And it was so bad for so many years that finally I just started praying. I don't know why I didn't get a clue of this before. I started praying, oh God, no more deaths in this area of, of adolescence of students. And it's like it stopped. Wow. But we were going through these things. I called my mentor who had developed cities for campus life. Uh, Youth for Christ in Miami and Clearwater and Orlando and Nashville and Grand Rapids. I said, Andy, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle. This is about our third ones before they had ended, and uh, it's not that some hadn't died since then, but they were like they were all in my in the student ministry we had, you know, because we did like you. We were on campuses, so we had people from all walks of life. They didn't necessarily go to our church, but they knew they were welcome. And Andy says this. This is why this is important for these youth pastors, youth worker nation. He said, Doug, I've never done a funeral. He said, I've never had to deal with what you're dealing with. <laughs> I went, 
Well, you're no help to me. <laughs> you know, um, so I... And you've gone through a lot of this. Yeah, you know, I, um, my oldest brother, he lost his wife and his two little girls. Mm-hmm. Four-year-old and three-year-old and his 33-year-old wife. Gone. One day. Boom. Car yes. wreck. And in that moment, you know, I remember talking with him. He told me, I can't even grieve over my wife because I got to go to the hospital to see if my child's okay. <sighs> Mm-hmm. And the hardest thing about that, you know, he held each one of his girls. Mm. And he held his wife uh, till she was gone. Mm. It was a little girl. Held each one of them. And I was there for when um, it was while I was working up in North Carolina. Mm. Got the call. They're in a bad, serious car wreck. Things aren't looking good. I got in the car, drove straight down. Spent all my money on gas trying to get to the brother. Yes. Right. Uh, trying to be there. And here's, here's what I'll say. I hate death. I hate it. I say the same thing. I think that death is not normal. And here's why I say that. Because death came in this world because of sin. Yes. And, and death will be thrown into the lake of fire one day. It, it tells us that in Revelation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Everything about it is not natural. We were meant to live forever and ever in the presence of the Almighty King Mm -hmm. and have life and have it abundantly. And I say that because I know that when Jesus was at the tomb with Lazarus, Mm -hmm. he's not just crying to show empathy. He's also crying at that tomb because he realizes more than anyone, more than anyone, why death is upon this planet. Mm -hmm. And he stares into the chasm of death and he knows he's going to the cross to take on death itself and forever defeat it. And so what um, has brought hope or, or brought any kind, of, any kind of semblance to anything in life? You know, John chapter 6, me and my brother Nathan, I've talked to him about this, and, and that's where he lands. John chapter 6, Jesus just got done talking about, will you eat of my flesh and drink my blood? Mm-hmm. Everybody's thinking, is this guy a cannibal? No, he's just saying, will you partake in my, my same suffering, mm-hmm. my same surrendering? And what he's saying also at that moment makes all these people because it's hard it's a hard saying you know basically what he's saying is you gotta give up your own life and -hmm. let me be the one that you are surrendered to all of them walk away and then Jesus looks at Peter and he says are you gonna leave me too Peter says these amazing words he says where else would I go for you have the words of eternal life Mm. when that one day changed everything because it did it still hurts. We've learned, and we say this in our heart, I preach this to my heart. And and youth Mm -hmm. pastors, you got to preach things to your heart. Mm -hmm. You got to get it in there and you got to say it to a point where you just say, man, God, how could you not love me? How Mm -hmm. could you not call me to do something? Or if it's his promises, remind him of his promises. You know, I'll never leave you nor forsake you is not just a promise in your pain. It's a promise even in your sin. If you feel like you've had the worst day ever and you did something, he still says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Mm-hmm. But in that moment, when we think of John 6, for something that completely turned everything upside down on us, we hear those words, Jesus, you have the words of eternal life. And if he says it's eternal, you know, that's in the scriptures, it can't be a lie. Mm-hmm. If they say that's eternal weight, I want that. Mm-hmm. And if it says, where else would I go? It must be true. Mm-hmm. Where else would mm-hmm. I go? Because mm-hmm. I've often thought about that in that pain. Well, if I didn't have him, well, then I'd just be stuck in that pain without him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Those are the types of things, because youth pastors, youth workers, you're going to have students that may go through things. Let's mm-hmm. say a suicide that a student has mm-hmm. or a mm-hmm. friend that loses somebody very close or they lose a parent, they lose mm-hmm. a brother. You're going to have things that you feel completely inadequate to go through. Mm-hmm. And even I feel like that on many occasions. But I know this. It must be true that the eternal words that he has are life. And then it must also be true, where else could I go? Mm -hmm. And so that's where I try to put guardrails up for students to go towards. Mm -hmm. In the the rawness of the pain, I'm just there. Mm -hmm. But in picking up the pieces afterwards, Mm -hmm. I'm pointing to the only thing that I know that says I have eternal words. Because I don't. He does. Another thing I know that you're going to get to is just talk to me about who's also helped me in mentoring. And it wasn't just my mentor up in Tennessee. I've had people that I've read that meant a lot and some in these areas. Mm-hmm. I can tell you, Timothy Keller has written some books, two in particular, Prodigal God mm-hmm. and The Reason for God. 
Those have helped me with students with forming and shaping them to understand that you have a God who um, says to you, I do not care what you've done, I don't care what you become, come home. And you have a God who is saying, even in evil and suffering that is upon this planet, one day he's coming back and he's restoring all things. Mm. And those are two very important things. Yes. Because most students, they question, well, does God really love? Does God really, is he gonna prove himself? In the, and you gotta point them back to the cross. Mm-hmm. I can tell you this, everything in scripture echoes who Jesus is. Mm-hmm. Luke 24, uh, youth pastors study Luke 24 because Jesus is on the road to Emmaus and he tells Cleopas, and I always think one day when I get to heaven, if I see Cleopas, I'm gonna be like, why did you not write this down? <laughs> and here's why. Jesus tells how he is found in the law, how he's found in the Psalms, and how he's found in the prophets. He's saying all of scripture echoes me. And what's amazing, um, if you look long enough through scripture, you'll see it, right? Abraham and Isaac, he's got his son up on that, on that mountain, and he's about to plunge that knife into him. At the very last moment, God comes into play and he says, no, he gets life. And he is not a good enough substitute, but we do learn centuries and centuries later, there's another hill and there's another life that has to be taken. Mm-hmm. And it's the only substitute that could possibly stand. It's Christ. And here's a question um, that I ask when I study scripture and when I actually give my students. I tell them when they're studying the Old Testament, ask, what does this look like on the other side of the cross? Mm-hmm. That's the question I tell them to ask. Mm-hmm. And I'm telling you that question actually rings true in all the things we've been talking about. Mm-hmm. What would this look like on the other side of the cross? Because without it, I can tell you those losses we've had, it makes you feel this deafening silence of no hope. Yes. But if it's true, what the cross displays, then it makes you finally say, I'll see you again. And for us as people, if this life was just we live it and mm-hmm. it's final and then we go into dust, man, what is purpose to that? But if there is beauty in the end and there's something that is greater, a grand design that's fit so that finally one day, because I believe in heaven, let's say in this life, you didn't mm-hmm. ever get to do what you want to do. And you don't feel like you ever lived up to your fullest potential. I believe in one day in heaven, you will live up to your fullest potential and you will finally do exactly what you were made to do. And C.S. Lewis, I believe, said it best. And you can tell some of these guys I'm mentioning, I read and I, I soak these guys in. Yeah. Look, even J.R.L. Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, you can find a lot of things, you pastors. Those guys were friends. Oh, yeah, they yeah, were friends. Actually, the Tolkien, Inklings, right? C.S. Lewis. And I think there's another two or three there that we would all know. Yeah. And, you know, C.S. Lewis said, if I find in this life nothing that can satisfy my heart, if I find this world nothing that can satisfy my heart, then it must mean I was meant and designed for another world. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. It is. I'm going to stop you there for a second because I'm going to add to that. Just yesterday I was talking to uh, uh, one of my former staffers. We've met for lunch for more than 20 years, uh, once a week. Uh, I used to meet with my volunteer staff, either breakfast or lunch once a week. We were talking about the Hubble telescope that was up there, and there's, they're getting ready to launch another one, and a newer one, a, a better one. They had to fix the Hubble one time, wipe off the windshield or something, <laughs> I don't know, or the other lens. But uh, they had to fix it because it went up, and that was a big thing about it. It was out of focus, so they had to fix it. So they got a brand new one going out. And the reason they want to send another one out is because they found that there are, and most stars are much larger. We're considered a dwarf star. Our sun is a dwarf, and it's massive to us. And the, the rest out there are, would, would just, it would take thousands of, of our star to our sun to, to make one of those stars. And they found that there are trillions upon trillions of stars yeah those those numbers don't even compute in they my don't, head there's they some don't huge compute. It's just and and here's here's what we'll compute a little more is that there are more stars than uh, there are grains of sand on the earth amazing and that's insanity to, yeah. uh, to our brain not being able to comprehend that but the one thing they said was he spoke and so is there a world beyond this life it's not as far-fetched when you look at how small we are as 
and a how galaxy. much we have not explored. I've not explored, and now we've got to sp- send another one out to find out what's beyond those trillions of stars. And they tell us that we have an expanding universe. So our God is big enough to encompass all of that and to speak those things into. Well, I feel one. So even with C.S. Lewis, I use this a lot with students as well. You know, J.R.L. Tolkien. Mm-hmm. What's amazing about that? J.R.L. Tolkien was writing about that because what he was saying is the thing that you love, the thing you find most precious, mm-hmm. the thing that your heart and desires and lusts go towards. Mm-hmm. He's saying will become the thing that you loathe, become the thing that um, you actually can't stand. And he was describing sin. These writers open up worlds to come at scripture and to come at things that these eternal words Mm -hmm. in a different perspective so that we could gain some understanding, gain some wisdom. How often did Jesus do that with parables? Come at it from a different perspective so we could gain some wisdom. Yes. And you know exactly what you're talking about. If we just sat and thought about the things that God's put around us, the evidences Mm -hmm. of him, I mean, it'll blow our minds. Mm -hmm. I've read that if Jupiter was not in its exact location, Earth would be decimated by asteroids. Jupiter is so large, and where it's at, it takes on heavy amounts of asteroids that would actually reach us and destroy us. I believe there's nine moons in its atmosphere, right. uh, you know, circling it. Yeah. I mean, even something that small, that insignificant thinking about what it protects from, not just what mm-hmm. it provides. And we have craters on the Earth. <laughs> right. So think about what, what missed us. <laughs> That's right. You know, from meteors, right? And so God, you know, how he is forming this tapestry of not only how he's working all things out here on this earth, but how he's working all things out in the universe Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to sit back and think something as simple as beauty. If evolution, survival of the fittest, if everything's just functional, what is the point of beauty? Mm -hmm. Because here's the thing I believe, and this is why I also encourage students when I'm at schools or I'm on campuses or I'm talking to somebody who loves the arts or they love technology, or they love sciences, I tell them, go. And actually, here's, here's the thing. In Genesis, we have a creational mandate. Now think about this. I know it sounds like a big word, mm-hmm. and it is. But God gave us a few things. He said, one, uh, be fruitful and multiply. But then he said, take dominion. He said, take dominion over every be sphere. Of, be in charge over every sphere of life. And think about this. This is before the fall. Mm-hmm. So everything that he was telling us to take dominion over, he said, Till the ground, take what I give you and make it better, make it good, make it flourish. Mm. Take dominion. Everything we take dominion over, because this is for the fall, was meant to give him glory. Mm -hmm. So the arts, the technology, the sciences, Mm -hmm. everything, every square inch upon this planet is his. And so I encourage students, you want to go into technology, go into, um, let's say, game art, go into whatever you want to go into, do it and do it well. All for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do it with excellence and make it so that you take that and you have dominion over that sphere in your life. Because if something as simple as a sunset points to a beauty that says, this wasn't meant for survival of the fittest. That was meant to bring me closer to the one I was supposed mm-hmm. to always commune mm-hmm. with, mm-hmm. being the creator. And if kids actually know that their vocation matters, that w- when they sit there and question, what am I supposed to do with my life? Do what you're passionate about. Do what you love and know that God's going to use that because he's the creator of every square inch upon this planet. <laughs> and um, of course, we take good things and we turn them, pollute them. Yeah. But yeah. be the one that takes bad things that have gone bad or mm-hmm. something that is good that went bad and redeem it. Mm-hmm. Because isn't God about that? Mm-hmm. Taking what's broken and making it whole. Mm-hmm. Taking what seems could never be right and restoring it. Yeah. And those are principles that we as youth workers, anybody just needs to come along students and say, this is what your life could show. And here's what I've said before, and I'll say it to you, and I'll say it to the youth pastors again. Middle schoolers are the key to what the future mm. is going to look like because so true. that is the most creative moments in our life, not right. according to analysts, not according to me, that that is the most creative moment in our life, I believe that there are things in our middle school years that we are passionate about and want to do that need to be the things we do for the rest of our life. Mm. And most of the time, we're talked out of them. Right. Oh, that was just, you know, that was, you got to grow up. No, you got to grow up. You, you, know, you got, we do have to grow up. 
right. to do what we were designed to do. I just did a memorial service for a uh, master mechanic. Dragster oh. guys all over Orlando, Central Florida, would go to this guy who lived in this town, and they would say, we need this part. And we're not talking about parts that are created or refurbished part we need this part created so that we'll do this thing and they would tell him and he would not have to go through designs with them he'd go no i got it and he would go and he'd make that part and you know we have students that love mechanics since Mm -hmm. they were before middle school and middle school they saw themselves doing that for the rest of their life in ephesians 2 10 it says that it says that in Christ Jesus, God created good works for us to do in advance. That's right. In advance, he created them. We're created to do certain things that only we can do, if that's the arts, if it's mechanics, if it's math, for those of us who aren't math (laughs) guys, right? And, And math is extremely important for everything, what we're doing in exploration. Math is what it's about, you know. You gotta pay your bills. It's gonna be math. Yeah, and all this but, goes back to human flourishing. Yeah, yeah. You know, and here's the deal: people ask me all the time, "Well, why why does God not agree with how these people want to have this their way or have this their way?" Mm-hmm. And and the thing is, is, if we believe that God knows us best and that He loves us most, which I believe that I believe He loves us most mm-hmm. and He knows us best. And could you imagine your best friend if you actually knew everything that's ever gone through their head? You might not want to be their best friend anymore. Right. Except God, who knows us best, still loves us most. Mm -hmm. That also must mean that he wants human flourishing, thriving, growth. Mm -hmm. So everything that he said no to in the Bible, Mm -hmm. he's saying it because this will hurt your human flourishing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything he said yes to, which part of that is that creational mandate Mm -hmm. that we're talking Mm -hmm. about, about how to take what's good and to help it to flourish, help it to grow, Mm -hmm. help it to bring glory to him. Mm -hmm. He's saying, if you find this, you have something that brings joy. Yeah. And I feel like there's so many people out there that have no joy in their work, have no joy in what they're doing. And part of it is because, like you said, um, they were either talked out of it, or they were told, no, that can't make them out of money. And here's the thing, I know doctors who are miserable. Mm -hmm. I know lawyers who are miserable. I know Mm -hmm. engineers who are miserable. Mm -hmm. I know people who are very wealthy, who are completely dissatisfied with life but then i meet people who have the zest and this fullness for life because they found partly or wholly what they were designed to be instead of what someone's talked us into that's right their parents who you know i'm not putting those parents down parents know their children better than we will ever know them right are you getting that parents know their children took me a long time to yeah, what makes them tick, what makes them do everything. That's right. Yeah, don't think that you think know everything about them. You don't. Don't think that you know most of it. <laughs> You're seeing one side, and you need to really appreciate those parents. And But uh, some parents, though, will, because of their pains in their life, will talk their mm. children into a... There's kind of a mold that they cast. To, to be one of these things so that their finances will be there because right. they need security when reality... When you do things that cause security, you're into those things, they make your life miserable. Right. But if you do things that you're designed to do, then security comes. I've known moms and dads to do that. They're on TED Talks, if you don't know what TED Talks are, it's a good resource. It's not a biblical resource. It is an intellectual uh, technology education uh, and development and uh, talks. And there's this one gal who comes on and she's talking about your your future things you need to do. And she is a uh, medical doctor. And she says, I don't like doing this. She said, I was talked out of my passion because I had the intellect and the ability to do this. She says, but this is not my sweet spot. Me speaking to you about my sweet spot is my sweet spot or something like that. You know, and she said, you need to pursue And she talked about some of the things that it does to destroy you when you're doing things you weren't designed to do. Mm. And, you know, I I feel what I've learned in the time that I've been in youth ministry, Mm -hmm. which just so you know, youth workers and youth pastors, I graduated seminary in December of 2015. So here we are in 2017. I haven't been out the gate for very long. My first church with students, I experienced kids that were struggling with transgenderism, same-sex attraction, 
same-sex relationships. Uh, that was my first church. And this whole idea, understanding of human flourishing is essential. Hmm. It's, it's essential when God talks about thriving. So this isn't just for the workplace and what you do with your life. It's also for your identity. And I would just really push to say, you know, study these things. Uh, there's a book by Bruce Ashford called Every Square Inch. And he talks a lot about this stuff. And it's a small book. It wouldn't take you any time to read, but it's worth the read. There's also another one that falls up called Every Work Matters. And so these are a series uh, kind of based off of a guy named Abraham Kuyper, who mm. um, was a was one who was in the political realm, mm. but also was a uh, believer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I believe it's very true that we need to be missional in every aspect of our lives. Mm -hmm. So uh, doing podcasts, going to commissioner you know, city commissioner meetings or being a part of people's life Sounds on a local crazy, level. crazy, but that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Yeah. Um, being in the school system, uh, actually, and here's and here's what I'll just say about that because it's important, youth pastors, that you know, um, being in the school system is not about just rubbing elbows with students. Right. Though we're with students, mm -hmm. I'll tell you how this funnel works, what I've learned, is it starts with the secretary and the principal. Mm-hmm being in a good relationship with them and the funnel tightens a little bit and you get to teachers and coaches mm -hmm. and then you finally get to students and parents mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you have to go through this process mm -hmm. and each level is just as important as the next one yes. and, and the things that i'm learning from this is that principal and secretary well i bring donuts up every day every wednesday to the school mm. and one's for fca one's for administration and staff mm. it would rock your world to know the amount of people come, you're the guy that brings the donuts. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And I'm just doing a little contact. It's a little bit of money. But you know what? That pales in comparison to the doors that's open. Right. The um, people who know I don't have an agenda. Mm -hmm. that I'm mm -hmm. there for them. Mm -hmm. And it's to the point now that they invite me on campus. The principal is inviting me on campus to say, I want you to be in the lunchroom. Mm -hmm, I want mm -hmm. you to sit and talk with kids. It's the difference than when when they're asking you instead of That's you asking right. them. And they're asking you because they are always looking for value. Mm -hmm. They're looking for what is going to make our world better here. And that is their responsibility. That's and right. we, some, most of the time, forget that our job is to be in the world to help and to love people do their job. That's right. And then we get to talk about things that we are there to talk about yeah, without, I don't want to asking, the burden. without asking. That's right. I, I used to say, I protect my teachers, I protect my principal, and people would go, what? what are you talking about? Yes, yes, these guys, you know, they are under the gun all the time. That's right. And getting hurt and getting hit and they're having to absorb. They don't need somebody else coming in yep. to hit them again or demand exactly. again. They need to know that we're a place they can that come for an oasis. And let me make this clear. If teachers and principals, anybody in authority, if they know that you're the type of person that they might have to worry about what you're going to do mm -hmm. or they may have to worry about what you're going to say that could impact them negatively, even though they may like you, they're going to distance themselves from you. Mm -hmm. But if you're the type that they know that you're, like you're saying, you're going to add value, you're going to add worth mm -hmm. to a program, and you're going to make it so that they know that you're for them and in their corner, they're going to want you there. Mm -hmm. And they're going to invite you to things. And here's here's how this works. I deposit things into that school, knowing that that means every now and then I can make a withdrawal. If I withdraw too much, not deposit, you can lose something there. And... I don't think these guys are getting that. You and I have read some things, yeah. and we've seen some things, and you've been in some areas. And so this is for these guys that you may have been in for a while, but no one's told you some of these things. What are you talking about? You made a deposit. Right. Clarify that. You said it. Yes. We've heard it, but I think it, they need to hear it again. Well, the deposit that I'm talking about, uh, number one, I've come on their terms. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I did not come as I'm youth pastor so-and-so, and I'm here to see students. I came as a level two volunteer at the Lake County School Board. I'm saying to them, the process you want me to go through, I'm going through it. Mm -hmm. And anything that you need me to do to walk in this area so you don't feel any kind of burden or feel any hesitation, I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And the strength of this 
is also me saying, hey, me bringing donuts, me giving my time, me part of the um, AVID program or part of the EBD or here at the ESE kids or going on a field trip with some students to a prison, uh, you know, whatever it is, I'm saying I'm all in Mm -hmm. and I'm here for you. Mm -hmm. So I deposit that. And when I asked this past summer, our church did a thing called Mission Mount Dora. Mm-hmm. The community knew it as before the bus. Mm-hmm. We gave out free clothes, shoes, shirts, everything, and free haircuts. Mm. I requested from administrators, I'm talking principals, secretaries, guidance counselors, and the superintendent to come to our church and do a walkthrough of what we were doing. They would not even thought about it if they thought I was somebody who never came around, right. never showed value. Right. And this was a withdrawal. This was me asking them to take time out their day to come here. Mm-hmm. But here's what happens. They come to that and I say, thank you for your investment. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time. And I'm so glad you could be here. And we show them, I mean, we put on, I mean, we wowed them. It was good. Mm -hmm. It's not like I just brought them to something that was going to be, you know, not on the par excellence, Mm -hmm. you know? Yes. But we did that. And that's for me doing little bitty things and major things of deposits to say, when I make this withdrawal, you know that I'm not doing this and I'm just going to leave you. I'm coming mm-hmm. back. And that's important. They they got the uh, people with agenda. They do things for a certain amount of time and they get what they want to get and then mm-hmm. they leave. Yes. It's kind of a parasite mentality. Yeah. Yeah. And the longevity. And we, we're talking about that. You can't even know if you're not going to pl- stay a place six years because it takes five to actually find out what you did. Oh, yeah. Then you're probably going to leave more problems than you are help. But remember when we did the bounce programs here? Do you remember that? Yep. You remember because everybody was invited and we made sure that everyone knew it. And so, of course, you were there. Even if you weren't there, you heard about it. That's right. And we invited administrators. We invited teachers. We invited coaches. We invited parents. It was for the students, but they needed to know that this was a place that there was nothing hidden from them that is going to enhance who they are. And they got to go to a place that they didn't have to work. Right. And we fed them too. And yeah, all, yeah food's always a good thing, right? Mm, Book yes of Luke, is. Jesus is either going towards food or he's coming from food. That's right. Just That's read right. it sometime. That's right. And That's uh, right. Here's, here's another thing. You know, it's hard work. It, it's, it's late nights. Way over and above and, what you th- thought it was oh, going to yeah, be. Oh yeah, unbelievable. Mm-hmm. You know, it's difficult knowing you got not just varsity, but JV. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then you're feeding teams, you're on the fields, you go to the practice fields. I get invited. If I'm invited to go to a practice field and do a devotion time, I'm going to be at that practice field and do a devotion time. Absolutely. Because that's an opportunity. I don't want to lose that opportunity. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of like the guy that gets invited to the birthday party and he never shows up. Well, at some point he's going to get quit and invited to that birthday party. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I want to be on that field and I want the coaches to see me. And here's the deal. So many coaches, there's a lot that are lost. There's a lot of teachers that are lost. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of athletes that are lost. Mm-hmm. And they, if they don't have you pouring into them, what else is pouring into them that time? Right, right. And I know that I've had conversations, casual conversations. That's what's been a conversation, not a presentation. Mm-hmm. Just a conversation with coaches about who Jesus is, what he's done. Because they ask me questions. Mm-hmm. I've had it with teachers. I've had it with students. They initiate these things. Mm-hmm. That's never actually in a captive audience surrounding. It's usually off to the side. It's usually just them talking with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, it can be one-on-one or one-on-three. It's happened different ways. Mm-hmm. But th- the truth of the matter is I give myself every opportunity to have those conversations. Yeah. And I'm just going to tell you right now, youth workers, youth pastors, it's hard work. Yeah. And it's um, nobody's going to see it. Only this, the other side of heaven, where you ever know what it's done. But you, know, you almost have to have a church planter mentality mm-hmm. that you're going to um, till even the hard ground. Mm-hmm. And hopefully, my hope is 20, 30 years from now, whoever comes after me, they're having an easier time. Yeah. And you've passed off the baton to something that they can take and run. Because mm-hmm. yeah. I want them to run. Yes. And, and right now, we're getting towards that point where we can, we can sprint and do some mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. But it hasn't been a full-on... Just marathon, run, Mm -hmm. run, run. Well, foundation takes a long time to lay, and it takes a short time to break up. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so you got you to spend your time That's laying right. it down. Let's go to your wife because here's the deal. Family is the hardest thing. We looked at it objectively just kind of doing the math. Mm-hmm. And my wife was probably a single mom 25 weeks out of the year. Wow. It's yeah. 52 weeks in a year, about 25 of them, because if I was going for a, a week trip, camp, whatever, there's a week of preparation. It took you about two weeks to get over it. So the week of preparation, week you were there, and about two more weeks to get over it. Sometimes it's two weeks of preparation if it's a mission trip. And so you're mentally you're not at home, even when you're home. Right. That's something to fight and something you need to find a way to do. And by the way, no is a better answer than yes. <laughs> find out how many no's you can say to everybody else. Because every time you say yes, you've said no to everything else that you could have done during that time. That's right. And that's from EO Fire and John Lee Dumas. And I'm, I'm not going to give you credit, John, for, for too much longer. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, I've mine. heard Andy Stanley say yeah. you got to cheat somewhere. Yes. Yeah. So tell me this. Favorite date night for you and your wife? Well, her and I, mm-hmm. uh, we love... <laughs> We both love going to Books a Million or oh, oh, uh, Barnes and Noble, getting some coffee, uh, yeah. walking around, or joke with each other, laugh. You know, me and my wife, we truly do. We talk a lot and we laugh a lot. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you know, I, big deal. It, it is. It really is. And, you know, there's that that balance. And we talk about serious things, but then we just have playful things. We talk about if mm-hmm. I'm in Books a Million with her, I'll show her a cover or something and joke about it when somebody's mm-hmm. done. Or we we'll go to Disney World and just people watch. Sometimes, oh, yeah. uh, you know, oh, we got yeah. annual passes for those people. And uh, I actually never even went to Disney really growing up. And then I marry her and we're down here. Mm-hmm. She's from Jacksonville and at Fernandina Beach. And I'm here from Eustis. So mm-hmm. we both do that. But, you know, favorite date night, going to Books a Million, getting some coffee, just talking, being with her. Um, it's simple. Uh, then walking around, uh, we make it dinner. Would she and go, say that that's her best? Oh yeah, she'll night? tell okay, you. She'll right. actually say um, she loves getting coffee and just walking around the bookstore. Now she doesn't read like I read, but she does read. She reads a lot of the same genre type stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But so it's easy to get gifts if I ever got to. Mm-hmm, um, yeah, I will tell you this: Hobby Lobby, going to Tuesdays or going wherever. I can't stand those stores, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but I will go with her. Yes, just to have. Um, because I, I want youth her to ask her guys thing. if you are there, and, you know, because there's youth pastor girls too, ladies. But my wife, uh, I would say, you know, we didn't get to go out this week. She says you went to the store to get groceries with me. That yeah. was awesome. What? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you went, you took care of the kids while I went out with my girlfriends. You know, that sort of thing. And so there's times that you've had a date, you just didn't realize it. Yeah. To her, and here's what I've learned, I have have to I have to win my wife's heart before I ever win her body, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. C.J. Mahaney talked about this a lot. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm learning, you know, even struggles that we have, let's say we get in an argument. Well, part of being a man, what women really love is reassurance and security in that relationship. And, you know, there's been times that I have to say, look, uh, I'm, I'm a little frazzled over this. I'm angry over this. Mm-hmm. I need to calm down. Just know I love you and we're okay. <laughs> I've had to say, you know, I yeah. love you and we're okay. Yeah, yeah. And there's been times that she says to me, Josh, I'm sorry. But you know what? Our goal, though, is to do life together and to make it look as humbly as we can. How Christ loves the church, being me, mm-hmm. in the sense that I'm dying every day for mm-hmm. her mm-hmm. and how she's just trying to also love me. And show respect and walk out this life in the way that we're saying, you matter. Mm-hmm. You're a person. You matter. Favorite date, favorite date movie. One of our favorite movies, I think, that we recently went and saw, it was, she calls me this. Okay, so just just bear with me on this, <laughs> all right? And I joke with her. She jokes back with me. But she says, I remind her of Branch from Trolls. <laughs> and Branch was the guy that um, he, he loved. I think her name was Poppy the one other troll. Well, there's a scene in it when she's playing this music and she's happy and excited and um, Branch comes up to her and says, may I? And he takes that guitar and he throws it in the fire. (laughs) And so she goes, sometimes you're like Branch where you can be, you know, happy, go lucky and then all of a sudden you're like, you know, Eeyore on some things. But, you know, (laughs) Branch still um, wanted to do all the other things the trolls did. He just mm-hmm. always um, acted like, ah, here we are again. <laughs> um, but in a, in a very real way, she really has just a love for people, and she's able to read people very well, discerning. And so I listen to her on a lot of things. 
I mean, when she tells me, hey, uh, watch out for this on this person or, or look for these things, you know, I listen. Mm-hmm. That's been great for our relationship, too, and the fact that I'm kind of the big picture guy, mm-hmm. you know, but she'll help me fill in the little details on a mm-hmm. lot of things. Well, don't forget this. Mm-hmm. Think about this. And that goes uh, that goes well because she's the arts person. She's all about the detail. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm I'm not. I'm the, hey, gun ho let's uh, figure out how to fix the plane while it's in air if it's broken. Right, right. You know, that's me. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's not like that. She's like, are you sure we should take off yet on this? <laughs> But, um, so th- yeah, that's been a favorite movie, probably Trolls with us seeing it. And it's not because of the exact, uh, I guess you say substance. It's just, uh, how we laugh through that one and everything. As far as substance goes, there was a Christian movie, uh, that I would recommend. And it was, we actually saw, um, Risen mm-hmm. about the, um, soldier. And it's interesting in that movie, he says, mm-hmm. he says, what do you long for? He said a day without death. I thought it was amazing because, you know, it, all the fighting, all the things he's seen and the very thing that he said in it. And I, I believe most of us uh, in this life, you know, what do we long for? Peace, real peace. That's what yeah. he was saying. So it's a great movie. You know, at the same time, I, I, mm-hmm. I think um, one of the books I mentioned was Prodigal God. Get a hold of that. Read that. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's worth every bit that you spend in that. Mm-hmm. You know, and youth pastors, I just want to encourage you uh, to know that. Uh, students really are listening. Mm-hmm. Uh, students really do know when you care. And it's one of the coolest things when you walk on a campus and somebody calls you Pastor Josh. <laughs> somebody says, Coach Pastor Josh, you know, <laughs> they have all these titles. I didn't ask for that. What I'm learning is if you're a leader, if you got to tell everybody you're a leader, mm-hmm. you're probably not. Mm-hmm. But if you're leading people and caring for them and serving, uh, before long, you'll be a leader. Josh, it's been really good having you here today. But here's what I'm going to let you close us out with. Okay. We just saw one of your coaches today, and uh, people need to know that you are a real, real person. You played baseball. I did. Let's talk about that play that he talked about with you today. Yeah, so Coach Thompson at this time, he was with Mount Dora uh, Christian Home Bible. That's when it was called that. Yeah. And uh, he called me up. He knew that I played. I was playing on several uh, kind of travel teams and different stuff with Eustace. And he said, hey, would you like to come and play on one of my teams this weekend? I said, sure, I'll be there. And uh, here we are. Uh, it must have been bottom of seventh, you know, like the last inning at that time because it wasn't high school ball yet. Yeah. And bases were loaded. I think there's only one out. And if we could just score a run, we win. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's all we needed. If we don't, you know, we go in the extra innings. We don't want that. Right. He looked at me. Here I am, first time on this team with these other guys. And uh, he tells me to lay down bunt. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what? Bases loaded. We got only one out. I'm like, I can hit somebody around. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, being a good player, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna listen to the coach. He, he requested I come. So I better listen to him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I lay down, uh, just a perfect bunt. I mean, it was right between, uh, the third base from the pitcher. None of them could really get to it in mm-hmm. time you to get the guy home or to get me. And, uh, when, I, when I got that done, he just kind of put the fist up in the air, pumped it. And, uh, you know, we all kind of gathered up and we, we did a little chant at the end. I mean, it was a good day. It was a fun day, a sweet time. But um, it's funny, after all these years, I mean, I'm thinking about that right now. That's over 10 years. Mm-hmm. Easily mm-hmm. over 10 years. That's probably yeah. 15 years ago. Yeah. And he remembers that, mm-hmm. which is funny because, I, you know, I mentioned it to him in the hallway. He said, oh, man, yeah, I love that day. <laughs> so it's interesting, you know, uh, I have several stories like that from baseball, little moments that happened that were good. Yeah. I threw out a guy from right field at home plate. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was, I mean, flat-footed. Wow. People were like, who's that guy? My dad's <laughs> in the stands. He's like, that's my son. Of course it is. <laughs> That's right, <laughs> and you know, uh, no way was I as good as some of these guys that came out of Eustis, um, where we're at right now. You know, Marcus Lemon, incredible. Oh yeah, uh, John Matulia, Matt Matulia. Yes, uh, they just had so many players. I know that we got what Matt, number one. Matt and um, the John both in ministry. Now. Oh yeah, both yeah. in ministry. Yeah. Brady Singer, I can't think came out here. Who's going to go number one in the draft? Mm. I mean, mm. number one in the draft is wow. coming from this area. Wow. You know, and it's always been like that. When I came up. They must have had six guys that went on to play D1 or pros. Mm-hmm. And I yeah. was, you know, how do you get to play with that? Well, it was just fun being around those guys. Yes. And that was one of the things I learned about sports was just the camaraderie. Mm-hmm. You know, great stuff. Always uh, a good time. 
And, you know, it also made so that I could learn to be around any group of people. And that was much needed in ministry. You, write, you know, you read through um, the New Testament, be all things to all people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I can't tell you how important that is in youth ministry because you get all walks of life. Mm-hmm. You get all different struggles. And, you know, so youth pastors, let me encourage you, stay the course, fight the good fight, run the race, keep the faith. That's it. Josh, thanks so much, man, for being here today. And Youth Worker Nation, you can find us at youthworkeronfire.com. And from there, you can find all the different places on social media that you can find us uh, so that you can download these things. We'll also be on YouTube uh, with some of our programs. So, Josh, thanks again. Uh, Josh, thanks how can they get in me. touch with you if, they, if you want them to? Well, anything you need, uh, my email, Joshua Douglas. 111. That's because I was born November 1st. <laughs> so at yahoo.com. So Joshua Douglas 111 at yahoo.com. There you go. Guys, get in touch with him. He's got a wealth of knowledge, more than we even touched on today. And Youth Worker Nation, this is Youth Worker on Fire, and we're out. You've been listening to the Youth Worker on Fire podcast. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and tell your friends. Also, leave a comment and tell us what you think. Stay tuned for more informative episodes.